Okay, so let us get along with uh, this third lecture in this series on uh, Riemann surfaces and algebraic curves. So let us uh, begin by um, recalling what uh, uh, we wanted a Riemann surface to be. Uh, the aim is uh, first of all I want to uh, make our definition of Riemann surface slightly more sophisticated okay. So, uh, so you recall that um, uh, we took uh, a real surface so we start we start with the real surface x. So, this is a surface which for the moment uh, is one that we can visualize in 3 space for example, the, the plane or the cylinder or uh, a torus or the sphere these are all surfaces that you can imagine in R 3 in 3 space okay. And uh, what is it that we wanted to do? We wanted to do complex analysis on the surface okay. So, um, so we wanted to do complex analysis on the surface. on the surface and uh, that essentially was uh, trying to do the following if you uh, are given an, an open set on the surface and if you are given a function defined on that taking complex values I would like to decide clearly when I can call this function as holomorphic okay. So, uh, so because complex analysis is all about uh, uh, studying the properties of holomorphic functions or analytic functions okay. So, well in order to do this uh, I told you that we have to use what are known as charts okay. So, uh, so this is achieved this is achieved by using charts u comma phi u i comma phi i if you want where i belongs to an indexing set uh, such that the u i power x okay. So, basically uh, if you recall phi i was uh, a homeomorphism from u i into v i which is an uh, open subset of the complex plane and this was a homeomorphism. So, this was our definition of chart and uh, then uh, for example, if I want to de de decide whether uh, if a function defined on u i is holomorphic all I had to do was to go uh, from v i to u i by taking the inverse map which is defined because phi i is uh, homeomorphism and follow it by my map my function. So, I get a function from an open subset of the complex plane into the complex plane for which I can certainly de uh, define what holomorphic is which I already know okay. So, we could use these charts to define uh, when a function is holomorphic and we of course needed to cover every point on the on the surface. So, we needed a cover of this surface by charts and uh, well there was one uh, problem that we uh, needed to uh, avoid and that is that when we decide the holomorphicity of a function it should not be something that depended on the choice of a chart because holomorphicity of a function should be an intrinsic property of the function and therefore uh, it should not happen that uh, the function is holomorphic with respect to one chart and it is not holomorphic with respect to another chart because charts can intersect. So, uh, we overcome this problem by requiring that the charts are compatible okay. So, the, the second condition was uh, to, to ensure that the notion of holomorphicity of a function defined on an open subset is intrinsic is intrinsic 
intrinsic to the function uh, that is not dependent on the chart on charts we required that the charts were pairwise compatible and what was this pairwise compatibility the pairwise compatibility condition was if that if uh, u i and u j were uh, intersecting non trivially that is the intersection was not empty then the transition function the so called transition function the so called trans transition function which I denote by g i j which is first apply phi j inverse and follow it by phi i okay. This transition function uh, is going to be defined it is going to be a homeomorphism from an open subset of uh, the complex plane to another open subset of the complex plane it is a homeomorphism and I want this to be uh, uh, holomorphic okay and that is and because it is injective that is also equivalent to requiring that this function is uh, a, a holomorphic isomorphism okay because an injective holomorphic map is also an holomorphic isomorphism the inverse also becomes holomorphic okay. So, it is holomorphic and uh, well so uh, once we are given a collection of charts which cover x uhhh and uh, when all these charts are pairwise compatible then we call this an atlas and we say that uh, uh, x along with that atlas uh, is now a Riemann surface right. So, uh, uh, a collection of charts u i comma phi i i belonging to i uh, that are compatible which means pairwise compatible and that cover x is uh, called an atlas and is said to give a Riemann surface structure on the real surface x okay. So, this was our definition of what Riemann surface should be okay. You take a real surface cover it by charts which are compatible and this collection of compatible charts is called an atlas and uh, real surface along with this atlas put together is called as a Riemann surface. We you can rather call it a Riemann surface structure on x okay. Well, uh, I just want to make this definition a little bit more sophisticated okay uh, in this lecture uh, in the following way. So, well after I gave this uh, uh, this definition uh, we have seen in the in the in the last lecture uh, how we can give Riemann surface structures on the plane and on the sphere okay. So, uh, we have seen we have seen uh, uh, Riemann surface structures uh, on on R2 uh, and S2 this is the real plane and this is the real sphere okay. We have we have seen examples of that okay. Well and I want to uh, in particular look recall your attention to the uh, to the uh, natural Riemann surface structure on R2 that makes it uh, the complex plane the usual complex plane. So, you see in particular so let me let so let me write that in particular recall the following Riemann surface structure. So, I will just uh, uh, abbreviate Riemann surface to R s so that 
I avoid writing it out in all the time and I can save some time. In particular you recall the following Riemann surface structure on uh, on R2. So uh, the atlas is just consisting of a single coordinate chart and what is a chart it is just the, the open set is the whole of R2 okay and the map uh, so let me make way for some more space the, the, the map phi from R2 to C is just the natural identification namely it takes x, y to x plus i y which is z. So this is a natural map and I am just uh, taking a single chart okay. Now this chart of course uh, covers the whole plane and uh, it is an atlas uh, the collection consisting of only this chart is an atlas because there is no compatibility condition that has to be verified. So uh, by logic if there is a condition that does not need to be verified uh, it is deemed to be true vacuously true. So this is indeed an atlas and what it does is that it makes uh, R2 into the complex plane C. So we say that uh, the complex plane C is a natural Riemann surface structure on R2 okay and where the notion of uh, holomorphic function is the usual notion of holomorphic function that we study okay. Now uh, also let us look at the Riemann surface structure on R2 given by the following atlas so here is my atlas my atlas consists of all possible uh, u comma phi restricted to u where u in r2 is an open set and phi is uh, phi restricted to u is the restriction of phi to u where phi is defined uh, uh, as as I have done it here nam namely the natural identification okay. So you look at you look at this uh, collection okay of course uh, you can see that this is a this contains this because I can take u equal to r2 and then I have that chart as well but then now I have uh, so many charts I can write as many of them as there are open sets in r2 and well uh, in principle it is very clear that this is also going to give you just the complex plane you are not going to get any other uh, uh, Riemann surface structure on R2 it is again the same complex plane. So uh, we really do not want to distinguish between uh, this uh, the, the Riemann surface structure given by this complex atlas and the Riemann surface structure given by this complex atlas okay we really do not want to do that and for that we just uh, uh, make the definition a little bit more sophisticated. So this is the motivation for uh, making the definition more sophisticated. So what we do we really uh, do not want to distinguish between uh, these two Riemann surface structures. Uh, since they both give they both give C the both of them give the complex plane and why is it that we say that uh, they give the same Riemann surface structure because you take a function <coughs> on R2 defined on an open subset of R2 it is holomorphic with respect to this structure if and only if it is holomorphic with respect to that structure because holomorphic with respect to any of these structures is just holomorphic in the usual sense. So really there is no difference in deciding whether a function is holomorphic. So you see uh, this goes uh, in tune with a philosophy of Felix Klein the great German geometer who said that the, the geometry of a space is controlled by the functions you allow on that space. So if I look at the holomorphic functions given on the Riemann surface given by this by this uh, structure they are no different than the holomorphic functions given uh, by the Riemann surface structure on this by this atlas okay so essentially they should be the same space 
that is the motivation okay. So, <coughs> uh, what do we do to uh, uh, what we put into the definition to make sure that uh, we do not really distinguish between such things. So, we do the following thing what we do is that you take two possible uh, atlases uh, which give Riemann surface structures on a given surface and then you define them to be equivalent if every chart in one atlas is compatible with every chart in the other okay you put this equivalence condition okay. So, uh, motivated by the above uh, we we proceed as follows. So, uh, definition two atlases on X are said to be equivalent equivalent if every chart of one at one atlas is compatible with every chart of the other okay. So, we define this equivalence or this is basically a definition of equivalence of atlas complex atlases it is a very simple definition it says every chart of one atlas is compatible with uh, every chart of the other atlas. And you can see that this is clearly a, an equivalence relation because this is symmetric about uh, the two charts okay and uh, well uh, there is something else that you can uh, also see you take two such equivalent atlases and take their union okay. Then you will find that that again gives you an equivalent atlas which is bigger than both of them because an atlas is just a collection of uh, charts which are mutually compatible. So, if you have two atlases which are equivalent that means every chart in this atlas uh, is equivalent to every chart in the other atlas. So, if you put them together you will still get an atlas because the condition for an atlas is just compatibility okay. So, it is very clear that uh, if you have two atlases uh, you can put them together and you get a new atlas okay and then now the Riemann surface structure given by any of these atlases and their union should all be the same you should not really distinguish between these okay. So, uh, the moral of the story is that you should try to change the definition in such a way that you include in an atlas okay as many uh, compatible charts as you can okay. So, we have uh, this notion of what is called a maximal atlas right. So, if there are two compatible atlases I can put them together take their union I get a bigger atlas okay and then in this way I can keep on uh, enlarging the atlas until it becomes maximal okay. Now, a standard argument using Zorn's lemma uh, in, uh, in algebra uh, rather set theory will tell you that a maximal atlas will always exist. So, this is a Zorn's lemma argument okay and that will tell you that given any atlas I can find a maximal atlas which contains this atlas okay and it will also tell you that the maximality will also tell you that this maximal atlas is unique okay and then uh, I am in good shape because I can now define the definition I can now define a Riemann surface to be one that is a real surface that is equipped with a maximal atlas. And once I say that then uh, you know there is no difference between the Riemann surface defined by this and the Riemann surface defined by this because both of them will have the same maximal atlas. So, that is what I am going to write down now okay uh, it is clear that the union of two equivalent atlases is again an atlas an easy Zorn's lemma argument
can be used to prove the following. Prove the following. So let me call this as well theorem. Given an atlas on X, that is a unique maximal atlas containing the given one. So, the, uh, the zones lemma argument uh, is usually ap applied in the following sense you have a partially ordered set and uh, then you verify the condition that every chain uh, in that partially ordered set has an upper bound and then zones lemma will guarantee that maximal elements will exist ok. So, uh, in this case uh, uh, the set is the set of all possible atlases on x okay and the partial order order is just containment okay an atlas uh, is said to be lesser than another atlas if every element of this atlas is also an element of the other atlas okay so it's by inclusion okay and if you give me a, a chain of atlases then it's obvious that uh, the biggest one is uh, is an upper bound or e even if the chain is infinite i could simply take the union and that will be an upper bound. So, every chain has an upper bound and now Zorn's lemma will, will assure you that maximal elements exist ok. So, you can find maximal atlases. So, uh, because of this theorem I can now define a Riemann surface structure to be uh, one specified by a maximal atlas ok. But that is just uh, 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 it is of technical significance because it allows you to identify these two Riemann surfaces as being the same that is the advantage, but in practice it is not a big deal because when we specify Riemann surface structure we are just going to give an atlas and then we are going to assume that the Riemann surface structure is the one that corresponds to the maximal atlas which contains our given atlas ok. So, for all practical purposes we will work with some atlas which is convenient for us it need not be the maximal atlas ok, but this maximal atlas is just uh, uh, a condition that I put into the definition of Riemann surface. So, that I really do not have to distinguish between the Riemann structure, uh, surface structure here and here ok. So, let me write that down So, I uh, let me just complete this So, here is the definition uh, a Riemann surface structure on a real surface X is specified by a maximal atlas. So, here is my uh, revised definition ok. So, if you want to define a Riemann surface structure on a real surface you take the one given by a maximal atlas ok. For all practical purposes we will only take any atlas that is suitable for our use and then we will say that we are referring to the Riemann surface structure given by the maximal atlas which contains the one that we have specified ok. <coughs> so, I let me repeat the advantage of this definition is that I do not have to distinguish between this Riemann surface and this Riemann surface just because they are two different atlases ok. The surfaces are the same I mean both of them give the complex plane and I do not want to there is no point in distinguishing between them ok. So, let us get back to uh, these examples that uh, I gave the last class. So, you see uh, our 
see I was trying to give examples of Riemann surface structures and <coughs> what I had in mind are uh, of course the, uh, the real plane and uh, well the, the sphere the real sphere then I also have in mind uh, the cylinder and uh, then the, uh, the torus. So these are all uh, objects that we these these are all surfaces that we can easily uh, think of in R3 okay. Well we have already looked at the, the case of the plane and the sphere so let me recall uh, that case because there is something there that uh, I have to formalize a little more okay. So recall uh, the following uh, theorems on Riemann surface structures on uh, R2 and S2. So there was this theorem which is uh, called as the uniformization theorem. or uh, simply connected non compact so this is the uniformization theorem for simply connected non compact riemann surfaces <coughs> which says the following <coughs> any simply connected non compact Riemann surface has to be isomorphic to exactly one of <coughs> A C the complex plane B delta the unit disc or u the upper half plane okay so this is a, this is the uniformization theorem for simply connected <coughs> non compact riemann surfaces take a Riemann surface which is simply connected so simply connected means that any uh, closed loop uh, on the surface which is a continuous image of the interval can be shrunk continuously to a point okay so that is <coughs> that just says that there cannot be any holes on the surface okay and uh, you take a simply connected uh, Riemann surface and assume <coughs> that it is also non compact and then uh, the, the uniformization theorem says that it has to be either isomorphic to C or it has to be isomorphic to delta. Delta is unit disc and you know uh, you can always find a biholomorphic map a Mobius transformation in fact which can map delta to the upper half plane you can map any disc into any half plane you know that so <coughs> yeah instead of delta I could have also said u okay u is a upper half plane namely complex numbers with imaginary part greater than 0 okay well <coughs> this is uniformization theorem for simply connected non compact Riemann surfaces and this is <coughs> this uh, tells you what does it tell you it tells you that if you try to look at Riemann surface structures on R2 okay because R2 is uh, uh, certainly non compact and it is certainly simply connected okay then on R2 you can put only two uh, possible uh, Riemann surface structures one isomorphic to C which is given by the natural identification then the other one is isomorphic to, uh, to delta and that was example 2 of the previous lecture and the Riemann mapping theorem ensures that these two uh, are not isomorphic okay these two are not equivalent they are not biholomorphic okay. So uh, let me also recall the, uh, the corresponding uniformization theorem for that applies to the, uh, the real sphere. So well let me first wrap this off.
also uh, theorem uniformization for simply connected compact Riemann surfaces. So, what does this say? It says any simply connected compact Riemann surface is isomorphic to the Riemann sphere which I will denote as P1 of C. I will denote it as P1 of C for reasons I will explain later and this example of the Riemann surf uh, the uh, this example of the Riemann sphere was the example of uh, Riemann surface structure on S2 which I uh, it was the last example in the previous lecture and uh, basically the two charts were given by uh, taking the two open sets to be uh, the sphere minus the north pole and the sphere minus the south pole and the coordinate maps were given by the stereographic projection on to the plane ok. So, and then you can I also uh, mention I do not uh, I hope you have checked it that the transition function is just given by z going to 1 by z and that is of course, holomorphic when z is not equal to 0. Of course, you will have to compose one of the stereographic projections with the complex conjugation to get the transition function uh, correct. Uh, and from this I deduced uh, or rather you can easily read deduce that if I try to put different Riemann surface structures on S2 I am not going to succeed I am going to get only one. All the Riemann surface structures I try to impose on S2 I am only going to get one no matter uh, what collect what choice of charts or atlases I use ok. Uh, well these are all these theorems are all uh, the are not easy theorems uh, the proofs are little involved but eventually we will we will try to prove them in the course. Well the reason why I recalled these two theorems is to draw your attention to uh, the following thing which I have to formalize because I said you see uh, for example here that any simply connected non compact Riemann surface has to be isomorphic to exactly one of the following. Here also I say any simply connected compact Riemann surface is isomorphic to the Riemann surface to the Riemann sphere. So, uh, I am here talking about an isomorphism between Riemann surfaces that is something that I have not really defined ok. But it is it is very intuitive and you will see that it is very easy to define. So, uh, the idea now is I am going to try to define when a map from an open subset of a Riemann surface to another open subset of another Riemann surface is holomorphic ok. So, let us go to that. So, let me write this what does isomorphic mean ok. Uh, so, we proceed to uh, formalize this. So, uh, suppose we are given a function f from u to v. <coughs> where uh, u is uh, uh, u is an open subset of x and v is an open subset of y and x and y are Riemann surfaces ok. <coughs> Suppose you are given a function from an open subset of one Riemann surface to an open subset of another Riemann surface. When will you call this holomorphic ok. So, you see uh, that is the first thing that I will have to define. Once I define this then I can define when a map from x to y itself is holomorphic and then I can define when a map from x to y is an isomorphism by requiring that it has to be holomorphic and the inverse map also is holomorphic ok. And there again of course, uh, it will follow that uh, uh, if it is holomorphic and if it is bijective 
then uh, the inverse map will be uh, also holomorphic okay. So that is the reason why uh, in order to formalize the notion of isomorphism I have to formalize this notion of uh, a holomorphic map between open subsets of Riemann surfaces and again well how do we do this uh, it is again by using uh, the charts alright. So, so let me make the definition as follows so uh, maybe I will draw a diagram it uh, should not be uh, it, it should be easier for you to visualize it with a diagram so let me draw one. So here I am uh, so here is one Riemann surface here is my Riemann surface x well and uh, here is another Riemann surface say y well and I have I have this open set here u in x and uh, there is some other open set here which is say v in y and well I have this function f okay and the aim is I want to say that uh, this function is holomorphic. So what do I do well I take any chart here on this surface which intersects u. So what I do is that well I take uh, a set here which is the domain of a chart so let me call this chart as u sub i okay and well uh, there is going to be a homeomorphism phi i from u i into an open subset of the complex plane uh, so let me write that also let me call this as uh, uh, phi i of u i let me call this as <coughs> I do not want to use v so let me call this as uh, well u i prime if I want okay and this is an open subset open subset of C and uh, u i comma phi i is a chart on x okay that intersects u that means u i intersects u and uh, this is the intersection okay. Similarly I take a chart on v which intersect a chart on y which intersects v so that is again a pair so there is another uh, uh, chart which I will call as v i this is the domain of the chart and then the chart also consists of a homeomorphism I will call it as psi i uh, well not i not the same i well let me use something else j if you want coming from a different index, index set in fact I could do away with the i's and j's but anyway since I written it let me keep keep them uh, well this is again a homeomorphism of uh, vj on to uh, vj prime which is the image uh, of uh, vj under psi j which is again an open subset of c okay and this is again a chart which uh, which intersects uh, v the domain of the chart the chart is basically uh, cons cons consisting of two data two data the, the first one is the domain of the chart and the second is the homeomorphism that uh, that makes the domain look like an open subset of the complex plane okay. So well <coughs> what I can do is that you see I can do the following thing uh, this uh, this shaded region here is is just u intersection ui and that u intersection ui will go to uh, an open sub uh, set subset phi uh, phi i of u intersection ui that is again going to be an open subset of this because under homeomorphism uh, the image of an open subset is again an open subset and uh, restricted to that open subset it is still a homeomorphism all right and similarly if I call this uh, this intersection of vj with v as uh, 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 I mean it is v intersection vj and well under the homeomorphism psi j it is going to this open set psi j of v uh, intersection vj that is again an open set open subset of vj v prime j well now what I can do is I can go from this open set to this open set by using the map f namely I apply phi i inverse <coughs> and I land in this intersection then I apply f restricted to that intersection okay right and of course uh, I do assume that uh, the image of uh, uh, 
that intersection under f does meet some part of this uh, this intersection so that I can compose okay. So I can I can look at this map from here to here okay and this map is just going to be <coughs> apply phi i uh, inverse uh, then apply f and then apply psi j okay assume assume that the f uh, restricted to u intersection u i or rather f of u intersection u i goes into v intersection v j okay. I can assume this <coughs> here of course I am assuming that f is continuous well now when I do this I now get a function from an open subset of the complex plane to another open subset of the complex plane and well I can easily decide if this function is holomorphic okay. So the point is that uh, even if this condition is not satisfied okay uh, then do not verify anything verify this only when this condition is satisfied and all possible charts here u i comma phi i and all possible charts there v, uh, v j comma psi j do it okay and if it is going and if this composition is going to be holomorphic then I declare that f is holomorphic okay. So uh, it is it is really uh, uh, it looks a little complicated when I say it the first time but actually I can say it in a nutshell by saying that well to decide whether a function is holomorphic all I do is that I write it in terms of local coordinates okay and check whether it is holomorphic because the moment I write it in terms of local coordinates it means that I am using the coordinate charts to get a mapping from an open subset of C to an another open subset of C and there it is easy to decide when a function is holomorphic okay. So let me write that down uh, uh, so let me write the following we say that f is holomorphic uh, of course the other word that is always used is analytic okay or analytic if um, uh, for any for any charts chart ui comma phi i of x uh, any charts and well vj comma psi j of y uh, such that ui intersection u is non empty v j intersection v is non empty the composition the composition psi j circle f circle phi i inverse uh, is holomorphic whenever f of u intersection u i goes into v intersection u j here of course I am assuming that f is continuous to decide if a map between uh, an open sub subset of one Riemann surface uh, and an open subset of another Riemann surface is holomorphic I just have to decide using the local coordinates okay and then you can uh, <coughs> see that of course this uh, uh, notion of holomorphic uh, map being holomorphic is intrinsic okay. So uh, it is not really going to uh, uh, it is not going to be an ambiguous definition okay and well we are going to say that uh, uh, two Riemann surfaces are isomorphic if you are able to find a map which is holomorphic and which has an inverse that is holomorphic and that is in this case also going to be uh, uh, enough uh, to require that it is holomorphic and it is bijected okay so well so uh, uh, that is when uh, we call the Riemann surfaces are isomorphic and 
that is the isomorphism that I am referring to in these two statements okay. So that is uh, that is what I wanted to clarify okay. Well now you see having done this there is one immediate uh, there is one immediate uh, uh, observation that we can make which will help us uh, in the following sense uh, note that with the above definition so this is a, this is a remark actually it pertains to a point raised by one of the students in I think it, this was in uh, the one of the previous lectures that uh, you know that any uh, uh, if you take any chart that is going to give you a function from an open subset of x to an open subset of c now you see x is a Riemann surface and c is also a Riemann surface okay and basically we required this chart on this this function only to be homeomorphic but with this definition it actually becomes holomorphic okay. So it is it is rather clever the definition of holomorphicity automatically makes the function of every chart a holomorphic isomorphism okay. The, the homeomorphism any chart defines the holomorphic uh, isomorphism between u and v u okay you think of u u is an open subset of x v u is an open subset of uh, C and we are in this situation we have uh, a map from an open subset of x into an open subset of y so y is now C okay. So the point is that all your coordinate charts all the mappings in your coordinate charts they are all holomorphic okay and now this gives you another view of what Riemann surface is it is got by gluing together open subsets of the complex plane uh, the point I want to make is uh, that uh, a, a Riemann surface basically is obtained by gluing open subsets of the complex plane and the gluing is done by the transition functions okay. So uh, that is the remark uh, that is what this remark tells us thus a Riemann surface structure on a surf on a real surface <coughs> x is gotten by gluing open subsets phi i of u i by by the holomorphic transition functions g i j which is given by phi j inverse followed by phi i. So this is the point of view that uh, uh, that I would like to uh, emphasize okay so we will stop here.
Thank you.